We are live again, friends. Happy, happy Wednesday. Hope you all are having a great day. Thank you for joining me as we talk about our favorite subject, which is herpes. <laughs> oh man, I say that and I was just being, I was just interviewed on a podcast and, and I was like, this is something like I never wanted to be a herpes expert. I never wanted to be talking about it. It wasn't like a goal in my life. Um, but you know, here we are. So for those of you that do not know me or are new to this, my name's Alexandra. I'm founder of Life with Herpes. I was diagnosed with HSV1 in 2003 and HSV2 in 2011. So I have been living with herpes for two decades. I've been living with it for a long time. And, um, I decided to go public about my diagnosis in 2017. And when I did that, I realized that I was able to support so many people. When I did, when I went public the first time, I went public um, at a conference. I went, I got up on stage and shared it, and it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. But what I realized when I did that, I was able to support people. I was able to connect with people. I was able to share something that was so uh, heartbreaking and say, hey, we can get through this. So that is why I've been talking about my life with herpes since 2017. Okay, so because you guys are new, I just wanna give you some taps and just welcome you and thank you for joining me and joining the other people here on this live today. If you have been here many times, you know that this is your opportunity to ask your questions. I answer the questions in the order in which they are received. So uh, the app sometimes mixes them up. I just go in the order in which I receive them. So I do my best to answer them all, but that doesn't always happen. Also, a little PSA, you need to keep this rated G, okay? So the social media platforms do not like it when we use any profanity or um, make it even PG. So it'll get, it'll, I'll get the notification like, we've deleted some comments for the safety of the community. And I'm like, okay, please, whatever. Anyways, so just do your best to keep it rated G. And like I said, I do my best to go through all the questions and answer them in the order in which they come. Also, if you are new and if you're just meeting me, welcome, thank you. Uh, like I said, I have talked about my life with herpes. So if you have herpes, this is a great opportunity to follow. It's a great opportunity to get involved in our community, get to know a lot about us. If you are not new and you're like, I, I'm here, Definitely share it with someone that you need to know that needs to know about this. Like I said, I'm I'm speaking publicly about it. I see that someone has a question. Just go ahead and ask your question, and I will get to it as they arrive. So I love the hearts. I love seeing you guys on here. Um, what app was it? Just some. Just ask your questions here, guys. I see you guys saying I have questions. How do I ask them? Just go ahead and ask your questions, and I will um, I will answer them. You were recently diagnosed a year ago only in your mouth. So that's awesome. Well, not I me, mean, not awesome. Awesome. No, I think so. As far as, as being diagnosed in your mouth or being diagnosed genitally, um, it, it's like a, um, it, it just depends on the location in which you came in contact with the virus. Um, personally, it's, it's, I have both. So I've lived with both and I know kind of, how to deal with that. Spices are too sensitive. Is it normal? Um, so yeah, that may be, you know, I don't know. I, I eat lots of spicy food. I have spices. It Sometimes it crosses my mind. I've talked to some people, like I, I talked to a girlfriend uh, who has oral herpes and we were ch talking about this um, lip gloss that we both liked and one of them was a lip plumper. And she said that she doesn't like using it because it gives her the sensation that she's going to get an outbreak. So she doesn't like using it. Everybody can be really different. I wouldn't say that spices would cause something normal, uh, some, some sensitivity, but it might be normal for you. It might be in the area in which you have herpes. Like, do you know what I mean? Like if it touches that area. Uh, will you and your partner have a happy marriage? I would say herpes has nothing to do with it. So it's a matter of, are you happy with your partner or, and are you and your partner on the same page? Um, herpes will not inhibit your relationship in any way. 
Um, it's a matter of it's a matter of being open and honest with your partner and open and honest um, in your marriage. You know, my husband and I, we've been married six years, and herpes doesn't impact our marriage. Does it get in the way from time to time of being intimate? Yeah, it does. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. But does it impact our marriage? No. Um, how do you, basically your symptoms to keep them from being infected. So how do you monitor, okay, how do you monitor your symptoms to keep them, to keep them from being infected even though the risk never goes away? Okay, so there's a couple of things that we can do. Now, I'm not a doctor, so you absolutely should ask your doctor if you have questions on this, but the best, best, best way, according to the CDC, to prevent transmission to your partner is going to be to take the antiviral. That's what the CDC says. That's what the um, FDA, that's, that's, what, that's what it said, is take the antiviral, which is Valtrex, Valcyclovir, Acyclovir. That lessens the transmission rate by 48%. That's something I don't take daily because I'm at the point in my marriage, I'm at the point in my relationship, I'm at the point in my life, I don't wanna take a prescription drug every single day. So, um, and I'm at the point in my marriage, my husband's okay if he gets it. Now, that's, that, that's what's going to be said to be the best thing. I would like to take that a step back. I think the number one thing in preventing transmission to a partner is to discuss your outbreaks. So, yes, obviously you disclose you have herpes. Okay. But then it's an opportunity for you to keep the dialogue open because there's going to be times that something's going to stress you out or you're going to have prodrome, or you're going to go, is that an outbreak? I don't know. It kind of feels like one, but it may not be one. And if you don't have that open dialogue with your partner, you might just proceed to doing it, and then all of a sudden, you accidentally transmit it. So I think that having those conversations when you're like, gosh, I feel like there's a potential outbreak happening. We need to just back off today. So that's the number one. Number two, like we mentioned, the antiviral that can be very effective in lessening transmission by 48%. Then we have condoms. Condoms lessens the transmission rate between 30 and 50%. Now I understand in a monogamous relationship, a long-term relationship, a marriage, you may not wanna use condoms. I totally get that. We don't use condoms. I totally understand that. Um, at some point in every relationship, a condom comes off. It doesn't matter if that's a week in or 10 years in it comes off at some point. And I would say that if you're at the point of marriage, if you're at the point of becoming parents, if you're at that point, um, probably herpes isn't your biggest concern. And third, the last thing that we can do is we can take some natural supplements that can help us. So that would be lysine, that would be monolaurin, that would be um, angiographis. Like I said, these are my non-negotiables. I talk about them pretty much daily on the lives. Oops. Where is it? Did it? Where is my? There we go. We have angio. Okay, let's go in order. So we have lysine, which is an essential amino acid. It's a protein that helps block the replication of the herpes virus. This is a non-negotiable for me. I take it daily. I use it daily. This one actually is an empty bottle because I ran out. Um, again, I use it. I use it daily. Then we have monolaurin, which is is lauric acid it is found in human breast milk and it is what helps it helps disrupt the outer layer of an enveloped virus enveloped viruses are hsv there's other viruses that are enveloped virus but specifically we're talking about hsv so it helps dissolve that outer layer that outer shell that um that allows our immune system to go in and penetrate that virus and then lastly is angiographis it's a herbal extract that helps with our immune system and specifically towards the HSV virus. So these are my non-negotiables that I take daily, and this can also help prevent the transmission to a partner. So that's very important to do. And you know, I didn't throw in my Secret Society wellness products. So there are some things, you know, if you want to um, calm your nervous system, you know, you wanna do like some self-care, we have lots of products like that. But specifically to help prevent your, your partner is one, communicate, two, antiviral, three, condom, four, natural products. That's what I would recommend. That was a really long answer for you. So I am gonna tap the screen because thanks for going through that with me. Um, 
and listening to me. I just saw someone say that they got andrographis, it makes you nauseous, is that normal? I haven't heard of that side effect. Um, are you taking it with food? Maybe, I take mine before bed. So I take mine, yeah, before I go to bed. What do you take to boost your immune system? So, okay, I was just reading an email. Um, what do you do, what do you, what do you take to boost immune system? I personally, I take, I take the monolaurin and I take the angiographis. These are both, these are both the immune system boosting supplements that I take. So I take these. And then I also take things like vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc. Those are also really helpful. I also, oops, sorry guys. I also, um, I exercise, I get fresh air, I go outside, and I also ground. I know that sounds like kind of woo-woo, but I ground. I also use an electric uh, magnetic current pad, blanket, I don't know, pad that I lay on 20 minutes a day that also helps calm my nervous system. So these are all things that I do. Can you kiss your partner without an outbreak? and they don't get it. So there's always a possibility that you can transmit herpes, and I hate saying that. I, I really don't like saying that because then it leaves us in such this gray area of like, am I always contagious? No, you're not always contagious. You're only contagious when you have outbreaks and if the virus is shedding. The problem is we don't know when the virus is shedding. Back to can we kiss our partner. I kiss my husband every single day. We've been together for nine years, I think. Um, I never can remember when we started dating, which I always have to ask my husband, which is kind of funny. Um, anywho, so I've kissed him every single day and he does not have herpes. So is it possible to kiss a partner and not transmit it? Absolutely. For me, is, but can you do it asymptomatically and, sh and transmit it at some point? Yes. Um, I just look at it as that would be not fair to our relationship, that wouldn't be fair to my husband, that wouldn't be fair to me, and that's not normal to not kiss your spouse. So I kiss him every single day. Um, it's just a matter of not having intercourse during an outbreak. Yeah, that's also really important as well, just staying away from, you know, we don't have an, when you have an active outbreak, clearly that's when you're most contagious. There's active DNA there, there's viral DNA that is looking for a new home. I look like Tom Brady. Is that a compliment? I mean, he's hot, but that's a man. <laughs> so I, th I think that's, are you saying, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll take it. So thank you. Um, he told my partner about your diagnosis and he says he can't stop thinking about it. What do I do? Okay, so I, hear, I get this a lot. Let's talk a little bit about rejection. And I think talking about rejection helps. I think talking about rejection is important. I just did a blog post, it went live today on Life with Herpes talking about dating, or we do talk a little bit about rejection on it. You can check it out on lifewithherpes.com. Um, as far as, as far as, as the dating, as far as getting through this, rejection is inevitable, regardless of having herpes or not having herpes. We take out herpes and talk about dating. Typically when we start dating without herpes, we don't have a lot of like heavy conversations to talk about. You're just enjoying and you're just dating. What having herpes does is it forces the convert, it forces a more intimate conversation up front. It forces more of a conversation of what are we doing with our relationship type of conversation. So, Three reasons why rejection happens when we're coming to herpes. We're talking about herpes. Number one is the person is not emotionally able to have these conversations. It's silly. They're immature. They're not. It's like we all know the person that like talks about sex or jokes or just oh well let's not oh what well, let's use different words. Let's not talk about it. Let's call it something else. Let's beat around the bush like that type of person. That's number one. Number two is um, 
Number two is the person has a deep-rooted belief that is not going to change. I use the, the example of politics. I use the example of religion. We can use the example of politics right now. If you are someone of the conservative mindset, you are not going to agree with the liberal mindset. If you're a liberal mindset, you're not going to agree with the conservative mindset. It's not going to change, right? So that could be something deeply rooted about herpes, is someone may have such a deep, deep, deep rooted concept of STDs or or him or herself like i would then be unlovable if i had it and that root belief just they're not wanting to change it three and the final one that is the one that is the hardest it's the one that i think hurts the most is the person's not into you so we think it's herpes we think that it's, oh, well, they're not into me because I have herpes. And unfortunately, that's not it. There's another reason why this person isn't into you. And where that one is the sting, that's okay. Okay, so we have to realize that this is forcing that conversation. Because back to what I was talking about earlier is if we do not have this herpes conversation, we just kind of start dating and it's fun and it's light and it's airy and then we kind of get into it and then into it and then we realize maybe we're into it six months but we realize like, wow, this person you know, has 37 cats and I hate cats, but you don't really want to have that conversation because you're like, well, it's just over cats, right? But that could be such a big issue to you and that could you know, eventually be a reason why you break up. This forces these kind of conversations. So if the person's not into you, this person isn't going to be willing to necessarily move to the next level. So I hope this has helped. I know that when we have that feeling of like, oh, the person's not into me, well, why not? You know, I've been rejected plenty of times prior to having herpes, and I don't know why it happened, right? Maybe it's because I'm a brunette, not a blonde. I don't know, right? Um, so back to our partners when they say they can't stop thinking about it or they're not sure, they don't know what to do. I would provide information to your partner. I would try to get an understanding of where he or she's coming from um, and, and try and get a little bit more of a, what is your mindset? What are we thinking about? Um, you know, what are your concerns with this? Have you come across this before? I would also share that, you know, two out of three people have HSV-1, one out of six have HSV-2. It's extremely common. Most people are not going to have this conversation with you. They're just going to ignore it or they're unaware that they have herpes. 90% of the people living with genital herpes will never be diagnosed. So there are other people out there with herpes that are just not disclosing it. And I would maybe use that as an, as an option as well to use that for conversation. Guys, thank you for the follows. I see it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to tap it out and just say thank you for the follows. Um, and thank you for the shares. I see the share button happening as well. So thank you. That makes my day. That helps all these other people that need to hear about living with herpes, life with herpes, what it, what it means, what all that. So thank you. What is the soap I sell? I don't have any right here. It's called the Reviver Soap. Let me see if I have one over here. Come with me to my other drawer. Do I still have it down? Nope. Nope. That's right. I cleaned everything out. Nope. Yeah, I don't have any soap. This is my herpes box of tricks that has everything in it that I have on hand and that we sell. So it was the Reviver Soap. It is organic, it is natural, it is handmade, and it has some awesome ingredients in there to help with an outbreak. It has eucalyptus in there, it has peppermint in there. I love it, my husband uses it. He, in fact, I'm always out of it because my husband uses it. My son loves it. It just makes your skin feel hydrated and nourished when you're done. But um, it is specifically formulated to help up with herpes. So you, I, what I like about it is I like to use it directly on the herpes outbreak. And that way I know that my outbreak is getting clean. There's also ingredients in there that are not gonna be harsh. It's gonna help, you know, help nourish my skin. So yeah, the soap is awesome. We sell out of the soap every single month. It's something that we cannot keep in stock. So if it is in stock right now, I'm not sure, definitely grab some because like I said, we sell out and then because it is handmade, it takes a while to cure. So we're like, we're always making more. We can't get enough. Do do do. Uh, can you share the first two? Are they the supplements? We have the Angiographis. 
We have the lysine, here's angiographis. This is a monolaurin lysine combo. You can also get that if that's something that you like easier. It's the same benefit, just less swallows. And then we have lysine. They're all linked for you if you wanna check them out. Again, they're non-negotiable for me. I use them daily. Does HSV affect blood pressure? It should not affect your blood pressure. I believe sugar is what impacts blood pressure. So, and also um, table salt, like iodine, iodine added salt is what impacts blood pressure, I believe, not the like natural Celtic salts and things like that. But um, I believe sugar impacts that. So I'm not, but I'm not a doctor, so I don't know. And I don't, I have really low blood pressure. So I don't know. Um, what amount of each supplement should you take? So I would go based off of what is on the recommended bottle. So on the angiographis, it has two, it, it's two. Um, on the lysine, it's two, two tablets. And then the monolaurin, I believe. So monolaurin, you would go onto the website that's monolaurin and more. And it would explain based on your height, your weight, and what you're trying to do, um, and male or female, what you're trying to do for, for like the protocol. So if you are having an outbreak, it's gonna recommend, I think up to six, if it's like just a daily, keeping my, ba my body maintained, I believe it's two. So you would wanna look at that on Mono Lauren and more. It's a third party website where it discusses um, the benefits of Mono Lauren. I just said, I just got where um, a lot, some of the comments were deleted. So I apologize if that happened. The pills are too big for me to swallow. Oh no. Um, it's just, can you like, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. How do you feel when you're getting an outbreak? How do I feel? A lot of times I don't, I don't feel them coming on. At this point, I've had herpes so long, I don't feel them coming on. Um, but for a lot of people, it is a nerve pain. It is kind of almost like for me, it's like an itch I can't get. Like, oh, is that, I just need to like, it's like an itch I can't get, um, an uncomfortable itch. Some people feel tingling. Some people feel nerve pain. Some people have swollen lymph nodes. Some people have exhaustion. Some people have flu-like symptoms. Ah, thank you. You answered that for me. Did you have the virus before to meeting your husband? If so, how did I tell him? Yes. So I actually uh, disclosed to my husband the day I got herpes, but not that he was my husband or not that we were dating. So I got herpes, I was 28 years old, and I my husband was my colleague at the time. So I came back into the office and my husband asked me, what's going on, you don't look okay, you're white as a ghost, what happened out there? Like, do you need some water, what's going on? And I, of course, lost it and was like hysterically crying on the floor in his office. So I told him then, and then fast forward, I think it was like four years later, we started dating, and when we started dating, that wasn't the highlight of the conversation, that wasn't, uh, we need to talk about this, it was, we had more important things to discuss, like we were colleagues, that is a big HR conversation, things of that nature. So where herpes came into play, it wasn't, it wasn't the like dun 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 type of conversation. Now in past partners, uh, in fact the, the gentleman I dated before my husband, I took about three months to tell him we dated, we were not intimate, we dated, we courted, we did all those things, we went on vacation together, we did all the normal things that you do, we just weren't intimate. Um, and so it came to a point of like, I need to have this conversation with him. And I was very nervous to have it with him because I liked him and I was, it was, you know, your ego gets involved. But I had that conversation over dinner. I wouldn't recommend having it over dinner, I recommend making it its own conversation, but it was over dinner. And it, it went well, we ended up dating, I think for like two years. So back to the next question, when should we disclose? Number one, what is it you want out of the relationship? If it is casual, if, if it's DTF, if it's like, just I met you tonight, then it's, that's all that needs to go into the conversation is, hey, I have this, do you have anything? Let's use a condom, boom, right? Like if there's no nothing in it other than DTF, 
that's it. Um, I personally would take it a step further and look at potentially safe method, meth, methods. I would look at it and say, is that something I really want to do? Um, and and how are we going to protect our partners, um, myself? How am I going to protect a future partner and all that? What type of precautions are we using to get tested? Are you going to ask your partner to get tested? Are you going to use um, some sort of contraception? Are you going to use some sort of um, protection in that matter to protect, prevent, prevent other fluid-based STDs, STIs? So for me, I would say, what is it you want? Are you very casual? Then just make it very casual. If you don't care about your partner getting tested, then don't make that an issue. If it's something that's important to you, then make that well known. If you want something to be longer term, if this is a dating, like I want to be in a relationship with this man or this woman, then um, I would use it as an umbrella conversation to talk about your relationship. What are we doing? Where are we going? Do we have similar goals in life? What does this look like for you? What does this look like for me? We want, I want to be intimate. It's important to me that we both go get tested. You should go get tested. I should get tested. And the reason why it's important for this, for me to have this conversation with you is because I am positive for HSV. I've had it for six months, five years, 10 years, whatever. And the reason why we should go get tested is because I didn't ask my previous partner to do this. And this is how I ended up with an STD. And so this is something I just have made important in my life and this you know going forward this is how i feel comfortable so that's personally how i would proceed you can you can take that how you want you can change it how you want there's other people that are like uh do it over the phone do it over text i'm a hey do it in person i came from the mortgage industry when i had to deliver a lot of important financial information i had to deliver um, sometimes some really hard information and in my point of view, I always delivered the hard information either in person or over the phone so they can hear the inflection of my voice. It wasn't over email. So sex is a big deal. And I think talking about this is a big deal. And in my opinion, it should be a conversation. HSV1, HSV2, they're, they're both herpes viruses. HSV1 is far more common. HSV1 is two out of three people and HSV2 is one out of six people. HSV1 is most commonly associated with oral herpes. HSV2 is most commonly associated with herpes down there. However, that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that, because if you have an oral outbreak, it doesn't mean it's HSV1. It doesn't mean it could be HSV2, you don't know unless you were to get tested. So really the difference is HSV1 is just much more common, um, but either one can go either location. Have you heard of mal, have you heard of months of nerve pain from herpes? Yes, we've, that's been a big topic. Um, we've talked about that a lot in our support group this week. On Monday, we, we actually spent a good 30 minutes talking about nerve pain. Um, and other members in our group were talking about nerve pain. The herpes virus resides in the nerves. It lives on in the nerves. So it likes to travel down the nerve and that's when it has an outbreak. Um, so yeah, it is, it is not, it's not extremely common, but it is common for people to experience it. For those of you that are like support group, what are we talking about? We do have a support group. It is with people from all over the world. I have it linked for you. It's the Secret Society, which is the herpes support group. It is a membership. It is something that is paid monthly. We have eight live monthly calls a month. Um, and it is, uh, you can DM me, you can chat with me. You can also um, talk to other people in the community. That's what I think is so beneficial is the other people in the community that are there to help you, help me, all of us. Um, what symptoms did I have when I first started? I was flu, I was swollen lymph nodes, I had just all this like um, inflation, inflation, <laughs> inflammation uh, in my genitals, like just everything hurt. That's how I kind of knew I was getting herpes outbreak. Have I tried the plant-based diet to get rid of it? I have not tried that. I just, I love meat too much. I get hangry. <laughs> So I, I, I enjoy meat and there are people that I know have done the plant-based diet. They have tested negative for herpes, but it does come back once they switch their diet. It may not be a sustainable diet for you. Do, 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 do. 
what do I recommend to minimize flare-ups? So a couple of things. Number one, I'm not a doctor, okay? So definitely talk to your doctor. But if you are wanting to take the prescription, if you want to take the antiviral as a prophylactic, there's an antiviral you can take. It works really, really well at, at creating or at, at allowing the virus to go dormant and minimizing the flare-ups. That's number one. Number two, I was talking about it earlier on the call. We have lysine, we have monolaurin, and we have angiographis. These are supplements I have as a non-negotiable. This basically helps block the replication of the herpes virus. This helps dissolve the outer layer of the virus so our immune system can penetrate it. And this is an overall immune system booster and also specifically attacking the HSV virus. So these are my three non-negotiables. I'm going fast just because I've gone over this already today. Then the next thing I would say is um, we do have some products that are awesome. These are specifically formulated I love the way it smells. They're specifically formulated to support herpes outbreaks. This one is the Rescue Bomb. I mentioned earlier our Reviver Soap sells out every single month. Um, and this Rescue Bomb also is like always out of stock. We're always restocking it as well because this is, you guys love this one. This is your favorite. It You can apply it directly to your outbreak and it has great ingredients like lemon balm, which is important, eucalyptus, peppermint, um, and some other great things that can help with the pain we do have a new product out that is amazing. It is the Herpes Fix-It Salve. It is um, right now on pre-sale. It will ship next week. But that is also something I would say you can apply that to the area that will help you with the um, outbreak. How often do I get outbreaks? I've had HSV2 for 20 years and I've had four outbreaks. H excuse me, HSV1 for 20 years. I've had four outbreaks. HSV2, I get them often. Um, I'll go through seasons of multiple outbreaks and I'll go through se I'll go through months with no outbreaks. It just depends on what my body is going th through. If you kiss someone with a cold sore, does the person automatically get a cold sore? No, it depends on that person's immune system. It's going to make it pretty, um, I mean, a person, that's going to be their most contagious time, but it doesn't mean the person's going to get it. All right, guys, I think I've gotten through the questions. Can you get pregnant if you have herpes? Absolutely, I have a blog post on it. If you go to Life with Herpes where I talk about, I'm actually nine months pregnant talking to my OBG. It's a great one, um, talking about pregnancy and all that. Do, 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 do. Um. How is the area contagious? So I would say the area of which you have your outbreak is contagious. Like my arm isn't contagious when I have a genital outbreak. My face isn't contagious. Like if you have an oral outbreak, like your forehead isn't contagious. You know what I mean? Um, but but I would kind of stay clear of the area. All right, guys. Thank you for joining me. Uh, oh, did someone say, do I take pills during medication? So the antiviral can be prescribed during pregnancy. I chose not to take any antivirals. The supplements are not tested on pregnant mommies, so um, I didn't take them either. So I would say talk to your doctor and do what you think feels right for you. All right, guys, I'm just going to tap the screen. Thank you for spending your day with me. Thank you for being here with me. Like I said, if you're new, definitely follow. If you know someone that has herpes, please share this information with them. Like I said, I am here sharing my life, doing my best to um, to to share my life with herpes. Is it risky for baby when pregnant? It's not risky for the baby when you're pregnant. However, um, during delivery, there is a risk during delivery. Like I said, I do have a blog post on this. Um, if you go to Life with Herpes, it is there. It's awesome. All right. Bye, guys. I appreciate you, and I will see you soon. Bye.